Muy, muy buenas tardes. Good evening to you all and welcome. Welcome to Casa Arabe. Welcome to you all. Welcome to this uh, event. This is, of course, uh, part of our series on open societies, uh, which is uh, co-led by Dominic uh, Ruiz de Besa from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, European Union Cooperation, and Pedro Martinez Avial, of course, is the Director General here in Casa Arabe. As we all know, the reports of um, many different international organizations always say the same thing. They say that uh, the North African countries, the, the Middle Eastern countries, are uh, the ones who, that are further behind everybody else with regard to gender equality, although it's true that in some countries um, there have been some developments and progress made, uh, perhaps more legal than anything else, uh, but, but since the so-called uh, Arab Spring in 2011, those protests, uh, they haven't been able to bring women into public life uh, on an equal footing with men. And often uh, these women still feel that they are second-class citizens to men. Tunisia, perhaps, is one of the handful of cases that is uh, perhaps uh, there on its own as a country in which uh, the protests uh, led to an improvement uh, in the position of women in society. We're going to be talking about these issues and others with our two guests, uh, these two uh, leading figures or champions even of uh, global feminism. I could perhaps say it's um, Arab feminism, but that is not entirely true. We have an Egyptian uh, North American, we have a Catalan Berber, both urban and um, Middle Eastern, North African and Mediterranean with uh, rural roots and uh, nevertheless uh, with uh, fingers uh, poised over the keyboard. They write, they talk, they write a lot and they spark controversies. And they uh, state uh, quite clearly that they are hopeful but they are also angry and they um, speak as plainly as they can. Uh, we have here the authors uh, of Headscarves and uh, Hymens uh, and the last patriarch with us. Uh, we have Mona El Tahawi and Najad El Chami with us today. They shout out loud and clear against despotism and authoritarianism. They speak out loud and clear against um, the patriarchy's obsession to control the female body. And at the same time, they point to a way forward towards defining identity and freedom. Sometimes they use literature, but they are also very close uh, to events through their journalism. Welcome to Casaro, both of you. Welcome to this series uh, on open societies. The, the format of the event tonight is going to uh, be a question-answer session uh, for the guests. Uh, for those of, you, those of you, I'm afraid, uh, sitting there in the aisle, you can't do that. It's just for safety reasons. So please join us. There are some free seats there. I'm so sorry you cannot uh, stay in the aisle for safety reasons. There are a couple of seats here, at the, here in the front. Join us. Aquí hay uno, aquí hay dos lugares, ¿vale? Bien, eh, pues tenemos un... So, as I said, I have a, a few questions uh, here that I've prepared, and I'd like to, to thank uh, the person who helped me to write the questions, uh, Amaya Reith. Uh, she's uh, on an internship here, doing some work experience here in Casa Arabe. First question, then, for both of our guests. Uh, the first question is, how old were you when you became aware for the very first time that as a little girl or as a woman, that your life was constrained by the weight of tradition? Najat, would you like to start that? Hola. Hello, yes. Good evening to you all, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Karima and Kasarabi, for inviting me once again to come back uh, here. Uh, I feel more and more uh, at home uh, here. Uh, 
So answering your question, I would say that there, there is um, uh, an observation of those inequalities uh, that uh, we've all been through, haven't we? Even when we're very little, even before we get uh, really to feel that we're feminist, to have a feminist uh, conscience, uh, before we really get to that point, uh, you, you, when you feel that absolutely it's all unfair and it's, it's, it, there's no justice to women in the world, you feel it yourself. I, remember, I'm, I myself, I'm, I'm from a little village in the countryside, in the rural world, and the patriarchy has no hang-ups at all about being uh, patriarchal because no one's ever questioned what they're doing uh, and they, they really um, know no bounds in, in the way they are. When I was little, I remember there was a, a place in the home that was reserved for women um, and men could go out and walk around wherever they wanted to for women, for us women to go out. We had to have an excuse to be able to leave the house. Women had to actually, the older women at least, had to cover their heads if they wanted to go outside. So there were some very daily customs there which actual, actually equaled sheer discrimination and just the fact that the women uh, were working in the house they had to have all of the children that that they ended up having because they got pregnant uh, with them so the suffering that was caused to these women as a result of that oddly enough though that feeling that reaction to injustice tends to be instinctive when you're small as a little girl but education and culture perhaps uh, stops you from reacting like the way and you end up thinking oh well you take it on board and you say oh well it's normal women have to eat after the men or yeah that's fine it's normal that um, a man has to leave the house uh, as he wishes and a woman if she wants to leave the house has to actually be escorted by a, a man even if it's a little boy so you get educated like that uh, they make you accept these things inside of you but it but when you get to the point where you need things, even really basic things, that is the day that you realize that this is, this is something that is deeply rooted and it's very hard to shift. As I myself, uh, um, I'm, we have, uh, I'm one of six uh, and four boys and two girls. I'm one of the two girls and it didn't take me long to work it out because the, the boys, uh, my brothers, didn't have to do a thing at home. They didn't have to do any uh, housework, and I had to learn to be a good housework a wife. I had to learn how to cook and so on and so forth, uh, whereas my brothers uh, could leave the house, and I couldn't, so very, very specific things. But in the end, I think the fact, for instance, that, that, that I, 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 I wasn't allowed to go out, that actually made me turn into a writer because my brothers could, could leave and I was bored stiff. I had to stay at home. I didn't know what to do. So I ended up reading and reading and reading and reading. And then I started writing. And it seemed something that wasn't at all dangerous. Uh, I wasn't, it was harmless. And nobody ever said to me, oh, don't read or don't write. It was harmless what I was doing. And look at where I am now. Um. Good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to start, as I always start at every event where I speak, with my declaration of faith, fuck the patriarchy. Um, I want to thank Karim and Casa Arabe and Najat and for all of you for coming out tonight. Um, this is my first uh, visit to Spain and I'm very happy to be here and thank you to Blanca and Capitan Swing for publishing my book in Spanish and for bringing me here. I hope this is the first of many visits. And someone's waving to me and hello back there. <laughs> <laughs> or someone's waving at someone. Um, all right, so I, I think that this realization that you're asking about, Karim, happened for me um, kind of back to front and then the, the right way forward. And I shared this story with Najat um, a couple of nights ago in Barcelona. I was born in Egypt and my family moved to London when I was seven. And um, my parents met in medical school in Cairo and they both got scholarships from the Egyptian government to study for PhDs in medicine in London. So we went for the sake of both my parents. 
And this was in 1979, which was considered kind of like the height of what we call second wave feminism. And my teachers, who are mostly you know, white English women in London, were always asking me, what does your father do? And at the time, I didn't understand what that question meant, and it's mostly in retrospect now, in hindsight, that I understand what they were suggesting. And they were suggesting that it's my father who does something that is important enough to bring us to the UK from Egypt, and that we all just follow. And what I realize now that they were suggesting and asking, and this is what they thought was my tradition, was that my mother didn't do anything that was worth bringing the family to London. And these are women who worked outside of the home as teachers, and yet they didn't expect my own mother to be working outside the home in the way that they were. So I recognize now that this was a very early lesson in how little is expected of Muslim women and how little is expected of Egyptian women, because they thought that my mother and us, the children, were just following my father. So I would always say to them, you know, quite proudly at the time, again, not understanding what this dynamic was, that they thought, oh, she's just a Muslim woman who just follows her husband. I would always say to them, you know, my parents are both doctors, and we came to London because my parents are both here to study for their PhD. So this was when I was seven. And again, I, I only realize this in hindsight now because I, I might have been a genius little seven-year-old, but <laughs> this, I didn't have the depth of thinking to understand what was happening back then. But then the realization that hit me full on, face on now, not back to front, or the expectation of others, was when my family moved to Saudi Arabia when I was 15. Because, so when we lived in the UK, I mean, I wasn't allowed to date and neither was my brother. So the kind of rules that I was subjected to by my parents were also imposed on my brother. So I, I didn't date, I didn't go out with my friends to clubs or anything, but we left London when I was 15 anyway. So it was just at that age when teenagers become dangerous. <laughs> and we went to like the worst place for a 15 year old girl to go to, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and when we moved there, I, I honestly felt like someone had turned the lights off because it was like, it was unlike anything I had ever experienced. I come from a Muslim family and this was not the Islam that I grew up with. My parents, again, both moved us to Saudi Arabia because they both got jobs to teach in the medical school in, in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia, which was supposed to be the, the liberal city, but Saudi Arabia liberal is, is, a, is a different um, spectrum. <laughs> and um, very soon after we moved to Saudi Arabia, I fell into a deep depression. It, it, was, it was really traumatizing. I felt like I, as a girl, was the walking embodiment of sin. This is what I felt being a woman and a girl in Saudi Arabia was. And I, I, I write in my book that I was essentially traumatized into feminism. This is exactly how I became a feminist. So I f at first, I lost my mind, and then my mind was saved by feminism. Um, Najat. Najat. Just a, a few months ago, we did actually make, um, present your book, uh, Mother of Milk and Honey. Uh, it's, it's slightly autobiographical, isn't it? Uh, I can certainly tell people here that it's about a little girl who comes uh, to Spain uh, to live when she's very, very young. And so this question is about that. So, Najat, when you came to Spain at the age of eight, what was surprised you most about the way women and little girls behaved? Well, the, the, the memory, well, it's a, it's, it's, it's a bit faint now. I was eight, yes, you're right. Uh, but perhaps the very first thing that struck me, the first thing I remember feeling was about the way people looked, their physical appearance. I remember actually one day I, w I, was, I, w I was in a, in a fruit shop uh, and, uh, and I saw there was a, someone buying some fruit with very short hair and I wasn't even sure whether it was a, a, a woman. But I'd never seen women with such short hair. And this was the 1970s uh, and, uh, and they remember the, the, the fashion then, very short skirts uh, and very uh, big jumpers. And you can imagine the cultural shock there for me. What a contradiction actually. And, and uh, there we were in Vic in, in Ibas Barcelona, and it was cold, uh, and uh, and they had bare legs uh, and with big jumpers as well to keep them warm. It, it was all seemed a contradiction to me. What else? Uh, I don't know whether it was something that struck me so much, uh, but but one thing that really made a difference to me was the role of 
school teachers, uh, primary school teachers. The, the, I mean, I was used to to being being a, a mother sort of figure, but I I saw that that there were these teachers that I had that, that had struggled for their rights, and some of them, not all of them, but some of them uh, in school, primary school, started to to talk to us about feminist ideas. Uh, they they were really revolutionary for me. Those teachers that I had when I was little. At the same time, they were perhaps putting into words an unease that I felt. They were they were perhaps describing to me in words that feeling that I'd had uh, about where I came from. Uh, that was that was really uh, my path. I think I, I I was I tried things out as well. I remember actually one day one, one of the primary school teachers uh, d gave us a talk on feminism, and I went back home and and told my mother that I wanted to actually do that. I wanted feminism at home, and because uh, uh, I knew my the, the boys, my brothers were doing nothing uh, at all ever, and I was the one having to do the housework. And I remember the the one thing I I said to uh, is. And, 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 and that they told us was that we had to work. I mean, being free as a woman means being a woman who works, but works and gets paid for the work as well. I remember saying to my mother, Mum, you have to work to be a woman. A woman, you're, you're, you're up at six in the morning and you'd go to bed at midnight, you've got six kids and, and you work all day. And I, I used to say to her, you have to go out of the house to work. So what I'm saying is, this idea that that the only the only work that is actually makes sense is valid is work that when you go outside of the house and those teachers those 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 female teachers I had were talking about not actually relying on men for money that, that that's so important you can't you can't say oh to a woman you're working such a lot but you you you're not getting paid and you need to go out and find paid work that feeling, that feeling uh, really is one that stayed with me, that you need to be independent financially. That's always been my obsession. Yeah, I always wanted to make sure I was that. Mona, in, uh... Mona then, in your book, Headscarves and Hymens, you, you write about that, that, that culture shock that move to Saudi Arabia was for you. You've actually just explained that, haven't you? You've just told our story. And you, you talk about how oppressed you felt. But what about the, 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 the very first uh, life change for you that was uh, from Egypt to the UK, wasn't it? Do you think that perhaps that feeling that you had in, in Saudi Arabia, it would have been less if you'd actually moved directly from Egypt to Saudi Arabia without that time in the UK? Uh, so I wonder about that sometimes because um, there's obviously um, a, a shorter distance, culturally speaking and religiously speaking, between mm -hmm. Egypt and Saudi Arabia than the UK and Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, there is a big gap between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And the reason that I, I bring up the story of uh, feeling that culture shock when my family moved to Saudi Arabia and saying that it taught me that there were many Islams, that there isn't one Islam, and that I grew up at home with one version of Islam that was very different than the one that was being um, promoted and propagated in Saudi Arabia. So I think even if we hadn't moved to London and then after London, Glasgow in Scotland and then Saudi Arabia, it would have still been a shock because I know from Egyptians who go straight there, Saudi Arabia is much more conservative than Egypt is. Um, the, the segregation in Saudi Arabia doesn't exist um, in that way in large Egyptian cities, perhaps in more rural areas that the, 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 the sexes are segregated, but Saudi Arabia um, has um, gender segregation you know, in, in just about every aspect of life. So yeah, it would have still been a shock, but um, you know. So by the time I moved, I mean, like, like I said, I was 15. I wasn't that old, so it wasn't. It wasn't like I was so impacted or influenced by British values, um, but something subconsciously must have happened, because by the time we moved to Saudi Arabia and I experienced that shock, Najat was saying earlier that you have a, a feminist consciousness even if you don't know what that is. And, and I became, I say I became a feminist when I moved to Saudi Arabia, but I didn't have the word for what I became when I moved to Saudi Arabia until I discovered 
Ironically enough, in Saudi Arabia, and I mentioned this in my book, at the university library, feminist journals that were put there, and I don't know by who, and I, I often like to think it's some kind of revolutionary guardian angel, some renegade librarian, some revolutionary professor, because as I always say when I talk about this story, there's no women's and gender studies program at King Abdelaziz University in, in Jeddah. So the fact that these feminist journals were on the bookshelves was a semi-miracle. But in those feminist journals, I discovered feminism from people from my own background, from you know, uh, Egyptian feminists, Nawal Sadawi, Moroccan feminist, Fatima Mernisi, and that was in Saudi Arabia. So I, I owe, regardless of the shock and the tra being traumatized into feminism in Saudi Arabia, I owe much of what I am today to Saudi Arabia. And I often wonder about the opposite of your question. Had my family remained in London, would I have been as much of a feminist as I am now? Would I have just continued you know, and followed my parents' footsteps and, and become a doctor like them and got married and had children? And instead, I, I am child-free by choice. I've, I've stopped believing in marriage. And I, I am not a doctor, clearly. And I really think that a lot of those things, my own opposition to um, various forms of socialization that I was brought up with is thanks to Saudi Arabia, whether it mm. wanted to take credit or not. No, estaba pensando que lo curioso es que Arabia Saudí. I was, I was thinking, uh, thinking about Saudi Arabia. You know, I think it's probably worse uh, having, of course, lived there. But, but I was also thinking that, that I mean, does, has that sort of stay said with you? Uh, you know, is it? I remember, I remember when we were in Catalonia uh, not long ago, so without realizing it, without knowing where it came from, there was suddenly this sort of. Of, of, of the wave of, of thinking uh, from Saudi Arabia, very fundamentalist, uh, and, and we heard the same thing. Uh, this Islam, this Islam, uh, you know, this Moroccan uh, is, Islam uh, that you were practicing, and we're thinking about the Rif, where, where I'm from. I mean, women, women, women never, never used to go into the, the mosque at all. It was very orthodox. I mean, it, it even came into right bang into Catalonia from Saudi Arabia because there were some people who came over, they came with their long beards and their long white robes and they came to ban things that we'd never had banned before in our own homes. And this, this, this sick obsession to control female bodies from Saudi Arabian people. They, they used to say that we they used to say that we had to cover ourselves up at a much earlier age. When, when I was in my village in the Rif, I mean, the headscarf, that tradition, the tradition was for married women to wear them so that people could, would know that they were married and it, it, it wasn't at all strict. And now, uh, now, now, I mean, this is a bit like uh, having a safety pin, you know, isn't it? Uh, you need your safety pin to, to hold it tight, otherwise it's no good. And these, these men came over and they used to say to us, no, 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 it has to be the, this color or that color, a neutral color. You have to make sure that not a single hair is seen. Suddenly, there was these extremely strict and, and norms that they were bringing to us that our families had never imposed on us. And I felt that then that, that the, I, was, I was the body of, of, the, of sin. And I remember when I used to go to, to the Saturday classes uh, to learn the Quran, uh, I was eight, what, nine, ten even, and, and, he, and I had a, a, a miniskirt at the time, and, and, and the person who was teaching the classes, I mean, he t made me go home to get changed again. He said, no way can you be dressed like that, and I was only eight or nine or ten at the time. So even, the, even though I, I, uh, uh, you, you don't live in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, pursues you everywhere in the world, doesn't it? Uh, to make sure that you know that your way of, of living Islam is not the same. It looms large in your lives, especially women's lives, doesn't it? Sí, la, la expansión del... Yes, yes, it's Salafism, isn't it? it, it or Wahhabism. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's expanded and, and over the last 20 or 30 years. It, it, it's really uh, taken hold of the whole region. Now, both of you have decided to call into question the traditional figure of the patriarch, or call it a question, or attack, or, or, or really, uh, you know, point your finger. What's wrong, Najat? You've been doing it mostly through your, your novels. Although, I know you also do write uh, articles uh, in uh, newspapers. Amona, you've done it, telling real life stories and even personal stories, haven't you? 
However, it's, uh, these attempts that you, to do that from, um, on your part, both of your part, seems to have been much more of an impact in Western societies than, than back in Arab societies. Najat, okay, it's different for you because you're not writing for the Moroccan society. That's not your target audience. But do you, what, to what extent do you think that the fact that you're living in open societies, that there isn't a different impact of your message? Um, I, I would actually challenge that because I think that um, what I write is read in, in Egypt and across the region. Uh, so many years ago, it was read in Arabic when I used to write a weekly column for the Saudi-owned newspaper, Ashark al Ausat. I was shocked when they first asked me to write because I, I said to them, do you know what I write? <laughs> do you know who I am? And he said, yes, yes, we know who you are and we translate your columns from the Washington Post and we would like you to write directly for us. That lasted for two years before they banned me, unsurprisingly. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. Huh? So I was able to you know, do the brainwashing that I could do within two years. And I used to hear from a lot of readers in the region uh, as a result, as a result of my column. And I agreed, you know, despite my um, intense opposition to the absolute hereditary monarchy of um, Saudi Arabia, I agreed to write this column because I, I did want to address uh, an audience in Arabic. So that lasted for two years. And then since then, and especially thanks to social media, uh, people in the region also read uh, what I write and, and they write to me. And actually one of the most moving um, examples of that came recently, soon after the Algerian protest began. And an Algerian woman who had written to me when my book, Headscarves and Hymens, first came out, she wrote to me again and she said to me, she sent me a picture of um, one of the icons of Algeria's uh, independence war against French occupation. And she said, I'm sending you this picture because, you know, this is a reminder of our feminist ancestors or, you know, living ancestors, so to speak. And she said to me, you know, what I'm seeing with women in Algeria right now reminds me of what you wrote in your book. This is an Algerian woman. And she said, during my classes at university, I once told my professor, I brought your book to class and I said to him, you know, we have to discuss this book. We have to discuss the, the importance of feminism um, in our part of the world and how the revolutions are lacking feminism. And her male professor, and she said to him, we have to read Monat Tahawi's book. And her male professor said to her, Feminism has nothing to do with the revolution. And that right there is exactly why I wrote my book and is exactly why I, I say my declaration of faith is fuck the patriarchy. So here is, a, here is an Algerian woman connecting what I've written in my book because my book was about the fact that the revolution has to be feminist or it will fail talking about how she took my book into her university uh, lecture in Algeria and only to be confronted by exactly the kind of patriarch that I wrote this book to oppose because the whole point of my book is that there isn't just a patriarch in the presidential palace. There's one in the street and there's a patriarch in the home uh, or the, a dictator in the street and a dictator in the bedroom and we have to overthrow all of these dictators. So um, some love me, some hate me. I'm glad that I polarize people because at least they have an opinion of me, but um, I think that they do. And outside the, the, the Middle East and North Africa as well, they were there were Women's Day marches across the world. So on International Women's Day, there were marches in many different parts of the world. And the International Women's Day march in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia, of all places, they sent me pictures of women in that march holding up direct quotations from my book in Kuala Lumpur. Mm. So that was incredibly moving for me. Bueno, yo creo que... I think each one of us... Um, tries to understand what's happening to us um, from the position we're in. I mean, I've never tried to understand what's happening in Morocco, in the Arab world uh, overall. I don't think that is my aim at all. What I'm trying to do simply is understand what it means to me to be the daughter of this Moroccan immigrant living here in Spain. And I, But I can't talk about that without understanding, first of all, everything that lies behind that and, and everything that comes from our origins. Uh, and it's all much more complex and, and complicated than our families actually uh, tell us uh, it is. And I don't think there is this... this borderline. It's not about whether they read you here or, or they read me here or they read me over there. And I would, I, of course, I hope but I will have readers here. But And then when your books get translated, then they can be read elsewhere. I don't think it's that. The important thing is to remember that when you, you 
come up with these thoughts and you're 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 treading down this path towards an understanding of what um, male chauvinism means to us uh, that, that we realize that we're all well, we have been very alone, haven't we? I, I used to think that it, this was happening to me because I was from the Rif area, and that the that it was um, there were the people were much more against um, women there than anywhere else. So it's good to be able to discover as you go along how other women are also living similar experiences in Muslim countries or in Western countries and how they too are trying to actually um, find words to describe that unease. I remember when, when, I, when I discovered Fatima Mardis or, or, or Nawal Sadawi or uh, other feminists, I remember that feeling and thinking, oh gosh, uh, this exists elsewhere. It exists in the place that I come from because when you're a, a migrant, there's there's almost a bit of, of blackmail about your feeling of where you belong. And when you start to denounce the experiences that you're having, the, the injustice against you as a woman, they say, no, 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 that's the Western idea. And if you're accepting uh, that Western idea, you're becoming one of them in the Western society and you're almost being kicked out of your place where you think you belong to, that happens over and over again. And that is something we have to get rid of. I mean, I don't, you know, get get rid of that blackmail about belonging. I remember, I remember there was a, 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 a quote, I remember, I, I heard the other day uh, about sexuality or uh, sexual freedom about it's always the crux of the matter isn't it we've had to fight much more on that front about sexual freedom it's difficult uh, but Camille Dote said that uh, that this isn't a, a western co conspir co conspiracy it's not an orgasm isn't that at all uh, and orgasms and sexual freedom in capital letters is not something that belongs to the west at all uh, just because we are actually crying out for it doesn't mean that we're actually turning our backs on where we come from we just want justice and, and equality but of course i have this relationship or this interplay with people blackmailing me for where I come from. When Arab women talk about the oppression that they are suffering in their countries, in Arab countries, a lot of them are being accused of actually handing weapons over to um, Islamophobes because uh, they're, they're, they often they, they, they shield themselves with the oppression suffered by Arab women. I don't know whether I made myself clear on that. Yes, yes of course. What, how would you answer that idea? Um, um, well, I, I, I've been accused of being an Islamophobe myself and, and suppose there I am, I, I'm on their side. That, how would I answer that? The, the, extre the extreme right wing um, people are never going to actually, those racists are never going to make me give up my own personal struggle as, as, as a woman. That, that's the outcome. If you have to think about the reaction of the Islamophobes at all, I mean, they actually don't need uh, any other excuses, do they, to, to be a racist or Islamophobes or, uh, or anti-Islam. And they just make up their own story themselves, just Vox, the political party here in Spain, it's making up his own story of Spain. They don't need uh, Muslim women to be able to, f to find some legitimacy for their own prejudices at all. I think you have to, however, be very, very careful to make sure that, that we're not silenced by racists, uh, that they don't shut our mouths. If we can't react to what they're saying, well, where are we? The feminist struggle is valid wherever it is and whatever your religion. Uh, there's something else I would say is that as a feminist myself, this, uh, this um, 
chauvinism, this pa the patriarchy that I've experienced uh, is, is, of course, uh, um, rooted in, in culture, but it's also deeply rooted in religion. And I got to a point in my life when, when that feminist um, um, confrontation cannot move forward without me confronting religion too. It's uh, the, the sacred text, uh, uh, the new form of uh, feminism, religious feminine that we're going to develop. Uh, uh, that's all of that ends up with 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 the final uh, result that our feminism is constrained, it's limited. I mean, uh, how far can we go in just reinterpreting the, the religious text? And there are some Muslim women who aren't believers and others who perhaps would like to practice their religion differently in a different way to the way they're told to do from different sectors. And there is diversity there. And the only thing uh, that you can do to make sure that freedom exists for every single one of us is for religion to be left out completely. It shouldn't be there at all. While we're, we're sticking to the, the message of uh, the religious text, uh, then we will always see that, um, that chauvinism. And they will say, God's on our side, won't they? I think God has to be kept out of the picture. It, it's, it's, you, it's for yourself at home, isn't it? And feminism should uh, be a question of women, their rights and their equality. If there is anything that is a factor that is discrimination against women it, it's in religion, well, I'm sorry. I'm not going to accept that. Even if it's religion, I'm not going to accept that. I don't care whether it's the, whether it's Islam or not. As a feminist, I cannot accept that I should inherit half of what my brother inherits, that I can't have sex uh, if I'm not uh, married, that I can't actually get married to whoever I want or to have a relationship with whoever I want whenever I want. I can't accept that. I cannot accept that my body is a problem and, and a conflict uh, for people at home in, in, in the public domain and that I am the one that always has to make sure that I don't provoke sexual desire on the part of men. As a feminist, and as feminists, we have to deal with that. We have to stand up and, and confront this. If we don't, then the freedom of Muslim women will always be constrained. Thank you. Yes. Um, so in answer to your question about the Islamophobes specifically, uh, Donald Trump has made my life so much easier. <laughs> Because um, I point to Donald Trump as exactly the kind of example um, that makes feminism necessary. And um, he is the perfect poster, poster boy of patriarchy. <laughs> so I always say that, um, especially if we're talking about Muslim women, because you're talking, or, or women of Muslim descent, or women who write in the way that Najat and I write. And I always say that we're caught between a rock and a hard place. And I actually, I could even call it a, a triangle of, of rocks and hard places because we have, a, we have an Islamophobic, racist, xenophobic right wing that does want to weaponize everything that women of Muslim descent or Muslim women say, and they want to use it to demonize Islam generally or Muslim men hmm. specifically. And then you have the so-called Muslim community. And I always ask, you know, who is this community and who represents this community hmm. and who speaks for this community and it's usually men. And that community wants to silence women who are pointing out misogyny. And they do that because they want to defend uh, mostly Muslim men. And they, want, they, they claim that we should shut up so that we don't give ammunition to the racists and the Islamophobes. Mm -hmm. And then we have a left wing that practices cultural relativism. Yeah. And through that <laughs> cultural relativism, they want to, to because they're so eager to show that they're not racist or Islamophobes like the right wing, they embrace the conservatives from my so-called community as a way to oppose the racists and the Islamophobes. So where does that leave me in all of this? And, and this left wing, some of them, act like they need to defend Islam from me, hmm. a woman who was shaped by Islam, a woman who hmm. was shaped by the culture of Egypt and Saudi Arabia and all of that. So I'm stuck between these three positions and I say fuck you fuck you and fuck you <laughs> because none of them are my friend 
And each one of them, and none of them cares about women. Each one of them cares about the other. This side is addressing that side. Yeah. This side is addressing that side. That side is addressing that side. And it's like women disappear through a Bermuda Triangle. You know the Bermuda Triangle? You go into this triangle mm -hmm. and you disappear. Women disappear through the Bermuda Triangle of racists, Muslim community, and left wing. And so and I refuse to be silenced by any of those sides and all of those sides claim to care for me and all of those sides use my body as a proxy battlefield as women's bodies always are. Cover, uncover. Sex, no sex, which is exactly why I called my book Headscarves and Hymens. Enter Donald Trump. So now many of the followers, so we have 60 million Americans who voted for this fascist fuck called Donald Trump. And he is a racist, a misogynist, an Islamophobe, a homophobe, transphobe, every phobia you can imagine. <laughs> but he did not invent it. Donald Trump is the fruition of decades of this rot in American politics. So it is always especially wonderful for me when an American who has voted for Donald Trump plays this, oh my God, Muslim women, oh my God, why do, they, why do they submit to misogyny? Why are Muslim women so oppressed? Why do Muslim women obey the men in their lives? Most of the time not realizing what I do with my life, which is basically to go around detonating all of that. So now Donald Trump has given me this incredible gift because the majority of white women in the United States knowing that Donald Trump was accused by at least 12 women of sexual assault and knowing that he's a misogynist, racist, homophobe, etc., et cetera, they still voted for him. So now I'm like, what is wrong with white American women? Why do they submit to misogyny? Do they obey their, what their husbands do? Did their husbands tell them to vote for Donald Trump? So now I insist that this conversation take place to point out that patriarchy is universal. Patriarchy doesn't belong to me, and my goal is to destroy patriarchy wherever it lives. Uh, feminism, Feminism, uh, religion, and secularity is actually the title uh, of uh, this, uh, this conference. Not uh, Islamic feminism at all, actually, uh, but uh, quite clearly that identity is the one that's uh, taking over here. Anyway, there are more and more women in Muslim countries, or, or certainly um, women of Muslim origin who are struggling and fighting to get equality. However, the, the most conservative people out there are still branding fem this feminism as an import of the West. And I doubt you were just talking about that. And that, it, that this feminism doesn't seem to fit in, does it, to, to the Arab tradition. It, they're saying it's just simply the, the outcome of something you brought into the country, in the country. Mona, in headscarves and, and hymens, you, you talk about how important it was for you to actually find Arab um, reference points, really, there. Uh, you, you, and you've mentioned a few already. Uh, Najat, you were talking about Nawaz Sadawi. Hoda Shawi as well. You were talking about finding them. I mean, what have, how do you feel now, both of you, are, are looking up to those people, those women? Do you think you have become, or you're going to be close to becoming those champions? <laughs> you want me to go? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I think that Najat and I are the new icons. And I say this with a great deal of pride and arrogance and confidence because I believe that all of those things belong to us. We have fought fucking hard to get to where we are. And I am going to claim that. Yeah, I, I actually, I call myself a feminist giant. <laughs> so yes. And, 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 and I do, you know, I'm, I'm only semi-joking about the confidence and the ego because I, I honestly believe that as women and as specifically as feminists, we, we have to embrace this and confidently say that. And I will just give you two examples of, of that. I was in, um, I was in the UK uh, last year I, I go there to speak in Bradford. Bradford uh, is the city in the UK with um, the largest Muslim population. It's a very working class town. It has uh, a long and difficult history with racism from white supremacists, the British National Front, and also with religious fundamentalism. And a young woman wrote to me um, who lives, she lives in, um, in Manchester, and she came to interview me in Bradford for her podcast, which was two, it was called um, Two Brown Girls, something like that. And she said to me when we met that you're the first brown woman whose book I read who shaped my feminism. 
and she's probably like 22, 23, and that meant a great deal to me. And she said, you know, you mentioned, I, I write about sex in my book in one of the chapters, but she said to me, please write a complete, total book on sex, and I said, with pleasure. So, so th th this will be a future book. Um, so that, that's, you know, a young woman who's outside of the context of the Middle East and North Africa, but who comes from a Muslim background. And then I also want to talk about men, because most of the time I'm happy to ignore men, because people always bring up men, and I'm the one who says, you know, I don't give a fuck about men. I'm here to destroy the patriarchy, not men. And if men want to join that fight, ahlan wa sahlan. If you don't, then be ready for me to destroy you. However, <laughs> um, in, I, I'll give you two examples of men. Before I left Egypt to go on tour for Headscarves and Hymens, I got an invitation to go and speak in a town in Egypt called Zazik. Uh, Zazi is in the northeast of Egypt, and it's a town that is very conservative, and it's dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood and Muslim Brotherhood thinking. Mm -hmm. And the university students there wanted to have a TEDx. So they wrote to me, and, and the one who wrote to me was a 19-year-old Egyptian student in, the, I think, their engineering school. Oh, TEDx. So you know TED, you know TED, that conference around the world? So TEDx is when people have their own independent TED events locally. So it's, and it often has an X next to it because it means that you've asked for the license to hold that conference and it's in your own city. So you can have TEDx Madrid, TEDx Barcelona, and sometimes it's TEDx at a university. So this was TEDx, it was brilliant, I loved it. And it's a really conservative town and like my mom was like, are you sure you're not yeah. going to get arrested when you get there or the Muslim Brotherhood is going to attack you? And then I had my friends in the ultras, you know, the, the hardcore football fans. They called the ultras comrades in Zazi and said, watch out for Mona, because if they do anything to her, we're going to burn it down. And I said, yes. So, so anyway, so this engineering 19-year-old Egyptian man writes to me and he says, Mona, please come and speak at our university because our community needs a woman like you to come and shake us up. This is a 19-year-old Egyptian. And when I got there, he told me, before I went on to speak, he said to me, look, I don't want this to change anything you say, but I want you to know how hard we fought for you to come. Because in Egypt, you have to give the interior ministry the names of the speakers. So they gave them, gave them all the names of the speakers and they proved all the names except mine. I was so proud. And these kids, these university kids kept calling up the interior ministry and every week, no monat tahawi, no monat tahawi. So finally, the interior ministry said, okay, Monat Tahawi can speak, but they told this 19-year-old, we know where you live, oh, and we know God. where to find you after Monat Tahawi leaves. And he said to me, I'm not saying this so that you change what you say. I'm saying this to you because I want you to know how important it was for you to come here. So this is an example of a woman and a man who recognize the power of women like us who are out there to destroy patriarchy. <laughs> Yo quería decir que cuando What I wanted to, to, to say was when I when I read um, feminist um, authors, I think I, I never really made a distinction between those that, who were who were from the Arab or Muslim world and, and those that were writing from the Western world. That that divide, that division. Uh, w when I was thinking about myself uh, in my own experience, uh, w was was one I just didn't see. I didn't see that divide at all. Of course, it was really important for me to to find Morocco. Moroccan, Egyptian voices out there, um, women writing from the Muslim world, but the contribution, uh, personal contribution made to me by Western feminist writers was also huge, because uh, they they were talking about the things that I had lived through or that, that, that were happening to me, and I, that the idea that feminism has to be split up and, and, and divided up and, and into bits of feminism and everyone has their own right to, to one part of it, it's your surnames on that one or brand on that, it's not that at all. It's feminism, isn't it? It's not about the, where, whether it's representative or not, or since when was that the problem for feminism, if, if it represents us at all, if we're the feminists X, Y, or Z, no, uh, feminism, our problem has always been the same one. It is uh, the, the men, it's the, the male chauvinists, the, the misogyny, that is the problem. And this, this label that, that they're giving us doesn't matter. Uh, 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 but and certainly don't talk about Islamic uh, feminism, please. I, I never thought then that the Western women were not talking about things that, that were the same for me. I remember there was a, a, a Spanish feminist that, that I really 
liked, uh, and, and uh, Amelia Valcaz, and she should be in all of these discussions today um, as a feminist. I remember she's a, she's a philosopher, really. She's um, she uh, uh, she's in the enlighten uh, the enlightenment uh, uh, trend, and for, she's a benchmark person for me. She's a champion. I mean, why not? Why can't she be for me as well? If, I, if what she's saying is actually makes makes a mark with me, and of. Um, uh, recent years, I think that suddenly this is the question: What sort of feminism uh, do you belong to? There isn't just—it's it, not the problem. It's a—it's a—it's a, it's misogyny different everywhere. So one of the things that is key when we as women uh, actually stand up uh, on a public platform to talk about these issues that we should actually talk about what is there behind that closed door that everybody's told us that you, you can't actually talk about that uh, outside. Uh, we are talking about those things in, in public, in the spotlight. That is an important step. There should be nothing that w should be um, not allowed. Our voices, our instinct uh, as feminists uh, have, have, have always been silenced, even if people didn't know that they were feminists. They, they, they've tried to keep our, our mouths uh, shut because they said, no, 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 they said, you just talk about that at home, behind closed doors. And that was the way it was for me. I remember that I just, I didn't even used to talk about these things. I used to write these things down. I didn't even dare talking to people about them. And even, even in private about the feeling that I had, that we have to, break through those walls and put everything out there in the public spotlight. Uh, and if it's public, it's for everybody. Uh, and the, the, the rewarding thing is to see now how we uh, are seeing that those uh, feminist authors who uh, sh sh shone the light on us uh, are, are ones that have actually pushed us into doing the same thing because uh, we're able to actually uh, uh, talk about the things that, 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 that with light, people that are living in the darkness, and, and, and I think it's it's a really long, painful process. It's been painful for me to get to this point uh, in my life uh, in which I can say that's it. I'm gonna I'm not gonna put up with any of this, any of these things uh, that are governing the way I am in the system. And it's terribly painful, you know, because you pay a very very high price for this. You pay the price because they. They kick you out of society, you are lonely, you're on your own. But that feeling of solitude is less painful when I meet girls and women who are out there um, discussing these things, who read my books or, or don't read my books, but um, even in a, in a small group, uh, maybe um, half hidden away from the spotlight, they are telling me about that feeling of unease that I felt when I was a teenager and alone. Eh, bueno, aprovecho para well, let me say at this point to, to uh, all of you here, if you know anybody who hasn't been able to come, that we are recording this uh, talk, uh, and in a couple of days' time it will be... Uh, posting uh, this uh, video and this recording of the talk uh, on our Casa Arabe website. So anybody who hasn't been able to come, let them know. They'll be able to listen to our guests uh, through the video there. I, I before I, I give the floor to the audience, I want to talk about or ask you about the uh, Arab Spring or the the protests or whatever you, you want to call them, the 2011 uh, protests, which seemed to be a watershed, didn't they? A turning point in, in the revolution that was being... Uh, um, led by women, and your book was, I know, prompted by that movement then. I, I, but I don't know whether perhaps the situation has got worse as a consequence of the counter-revolution or the repression that followed on from th these protests. You, you yourself, have, 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 Mona, you've had first-hand experience of it. I know that Najat hasn't, but, but of course, there were those protests in the reef area. Uh, they are also uh, close to, to, to you. But how do you see the situation now, uh, post-Arab Spring? Um, if anything, I think that because the revolutions in so many countries, like Egypt and others, obviously the situation in Syria deserves a whole panel on its own, so I won't get into Syria so much because it's, it's much more complex um, and, and tragic in many instances. A, a wonderful, non-violent religion was co-opted by so many sides. Um, 
but I'll talk about Egypt specifically. And I see what happened in Egypt as this strictly political revolution that I speak about, and this is why I wrote my book, that I saw that men and women together rose up against the dictator in the presidential palace. But I, I, and since then, it's remained all the focus, whether it's the media from outside of Egypt or much of the discourse inside of Egypt, so much of it has focused on this so-called purely political revolution. Now, everything is political, obviously. How I eat, how I dress, how I fuck, the way I speak, everything is political. But I'm talking about that revolution that is trying to dislodge the regime, because that was the, the original goal, the people demand the fall of the regime. And the regime did not fall in Egypt. We got rid of one figurehead of the regime, and that is Hosni Mubarak. And since then, it's been one group of men fighting another group of men for a slice of that power. And we're constantly stuck in Egypt or forced to choose between the military and the Muslim Brotherhood. And I reject both. And there are many of us in Egypt who reject both. So that's as far as the so-called strictly political revolution that honestly doesn't interest me that much. I am much more interested in the sexual revolution and the social revolution. And in that arena, things have changed. And the main reason that things have changed is that when people rose up, against that dictator in the presidential palace, even if you weren't on the streets, you saw people say no to authority. And that is revolutionary, because you then believe that you have the right to say no to authority. So you are now saying, you're seeing people in Egypt say no to the authority of the family, the authority of the police, the authority of the mosque and the church. So many authorities are being questioned in Egypt. And I'm much more interested in the way that we're questioning ownership of our bodies. So I look at my own extended family and my family, my mother is one of 11 and my dad is one of eight. And every time I meet my parents, whether it's in Egypt or in the US, I always ask them, you know, so what's the family news? And some of my cousins were, uh, attended a few protests, but most of, I would say most of my extended family did not directly take part in the revolution. And the number of cousins that have either initiated divorce or have taken off the hijab or have left Egypt altogether, female cousins who have left Egypt altogether. And I have one female cousin who removed her headscarf got a lip ring, moved to Berlin by herself and basically said, fuck all of you, I'm leaving. <laughs> and this is a woman, an Egyptian woman who left by herself. Now in Egypt, the tradition is men and women live at home until they get married. And here is this cousin of mine in her 20s who left all of that behind and moved to Berlin. Who was this fucking happening place, you know? There's so many Egyptians who live in Berlin now uh, who, are, who are in exile from all of those authorities. And then I'm also told that I have these aunts who are of an older generation who themselves initiated divorce. I have another cousin, took off her hijab, divorced her husband, her mother disowned her. She said, I don't care. I'm going to be a single mother. I'm going to make this work. And now her mother, my aunt, who's only four years older than me, has had to accept her. So when I ask my parents, why do you think all of this is happening? Their immediate answer is the revolution. And this for me is the real revolution. When it goes home, when, when you are rising up against the dictator in the bedroom, when you are rising up against the dictator in the street and demanding your right in public space. And, and, and even more um, important and critical to that revolution for me, because it's called why the Middle East needs a sexual revolution, is the ownership of our body. And in 2017, some of you might know that the Egyptian regime carried out an unprecedented attack against the LGBTQ community in Egypt. Ostensibly, it was because rainbow pride flags were flown at the concert of the Lebanese band Masrua Layla. It was a concert that was attended by 35,000 people, and the singer, the lead singer of Masrua Layla, Hamid Sinnu, is an openly gay man. And he's the only openly gay Arab celebrity. Now, we know that there are many, but he's the only openly gay one. And he often sings the poetry of Abu Nawas, who himself was gay, Safo, who was gay, and he's, op he's out. So the regime cracked down and arrested around 71 people, mostly gay men, put several of them on trial, subjected them to anal tests, which, is, which are a form of torture, and they knew they could count on rampant homophobia in Egypt. But I believe it was not because of the rainbow flags that the Egyptian regime cracked down. It was because they recognized that the LGBTQ community in Egypt is becoming increasingly visible. We are becoming increasingly bold in our ownership of our body, bodies, plural, and our sexualities. And just like national security is used as an umbrella term, to crack down on any dissent. Now, inciting debauchery is the umbrella term to crack down on any sexual 
dissent, be it against patriarchy's norms, heteronormativity, or conservatism generally. That is the revolution that I am most interested in because that's when we start overthrowing the dictator in the bedroom because all dictators go into the bedroom. <laughs> No, you're not, no. Not quite. Obviously, I haven't experienced this first time myself. I wasn't there in the revolution. But I think the reaction that, that, that we saw here um, when the revolution took place was interesting to think about. We, we were so used to that stereotyped idea of the Muslim world, weren't we? And the, the word everybody uses uh, that people are just uh, simply submissive, you know, that they talk about submissive women. And and when you talk about submissive women, you're not actually criticizing the man, are you? You're actually just really talking about the woman's attitude, or being critical of the woman's attitude, and nobody actually asks uh, the poor woman if she uh, is happy uh, with the fact that she has to uh, submit to the man. We just use that adjective, don't we? And you get used to, or we got used to, didn't we? Uh, that uh, idea of uh, the Muslim world uh, and the men there and nothing ever happened uh, and people uh, just simply uh, uh, were stuck uh, in uh, these dictatorships uh, and their world and suddenly the Arab Springs uh, that, that, that basically uh, pulled all of that out. Uh, we saw the innards of what was happening. It, it was uh, what had always been happening but I think suddenly it hit the headlines, didn't it? And even so, even though the, the, what we were seeing, the real life events, reality in the headlines, you know, a lot of people used to, I remember them saying that this will never last. No, 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 this, this can't last really because these people will never ever change. These countries never change them. That's what people said. And that is, that is our, our typical view, isn't it? it it's not. It's not just the, the dictators uh, who basically turn their backs on, on uh, these uh, movements uh, at all and these, these revolutionary movements, the feminist movements. Uh, What's happened in the past is that uh, the, the feminists and their role in the, in, the, in, the, in the Arab world, I mean, their role has been completely ignored or, or didn't, uh, as if it didn't exist. I think we're, we're we're more prepared to say that, that it, 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 it shouldn't exist than to really say, no, 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 it's, it's all about oppression. For instance, let me, uh, let, me, let me think about and talk about Morocco and compare it with Morocco. For, there was a left-wing movement that, that for decades, and, and it was uh, quite ferociously repressed, and nobody, nobody heard about it here at all, and nobody ever talked about those poor women who were put in prison, who were tortured, and who are still there and still uh, uh, defending their principles, because the only thing you see on the surface is, is, is that image, you know, that, it, it, that, that, that is what the image is of a Muslim woman in, in her world, that's people, what people see, so it, so it is really surprising. Even even here, uh, people uh, on the left here of the political spectrum don't really see that reality. Perhaps, but we don't actually like seeing uh, that break away from our stereotype.